Hello everyone, today we talk about the Kingdoms of Burgundy, uh, a name that was given to various states located in Western Europe during the Middle Ages. I already made videos about Burgundian history altogether. There is an old one from the Germanic uh, people's series about the Burgundians, specifically that we will also briefly cover today. I made uh, multiple videos about the the, uh, I make one at least about the Dutch of Burgundy um, for the historical region series. Then we talked about Valois Burgundy and uh, later Burgundian state, albeit mostly from a military point of view, so not really making an introduction to that. Um, and as you know, the there is a difference between the, the duchy and the sum of territories across, in fact, France and the Holy Roman Empire that would make the Burgundian state up to the death of Charles the Bold. Uh, and then there is the so-called Kingdom of uh, Provence Arles uh, and also Burgundy and as we will see this, the history is complicated as a matter of fact. It was a Kingdom of Provence, um, uh, uh, Cisjuren and Transjuren as they called them, Burgundy, right? Uh, speaking of the fact the uh, the northern and southern part of the older, let's say at least what had become in, in under the Merovingians, the Carolingians, the, the kingdom of Burgundy, the, the crown of which was resumed at some point used by the same Merovingians, albeit the Burgundians had fundamentally been crushed as an independent power and the uh, Franco-Burgundian nobility had uh, just entered the bigger game. Uh, in actually in a privileged way because the Burgundy was actually the only uh, let's say non-Frankish land to become de facto a core um, a part of the core of the Carolingian Empire political and military I made a video incidentally about this so you can find that in the Carolingian history playlist but the high medieval one um, is that we'll cover most today has in fact a very interesting story, also a very complicated one. When you look at mm, uh, Bolzo, Louis III, Rudolf I and II, uh, Jug of R slash Italy, etc., you, you find really a, a very complicated story that you also cannot quite study just by looking at Burgundian history, because for example the history of Jug of R, but also the one of Rudolf II is connected mostly to the Italic Kingdom. Uh, this post Carolingian context where still the imperial crown was, was toyed with especially by these sovereigns that were closer to Rome uh, before the Ottonian revival and then there is also the uh, the later history of the kingdom of Arles that became as as you know part of the possessions of the Germanic uh, monarchy uh, together with in fact Germany Italy and Burgundy, right? That was something different, for example, from, from the Kingdom of France. And and so also that story is um, is actually complex and relatively complicated, but it must be focused specifically as such. So this is not going to be an easy video, and I will try to be concise, getting just also, even that this is for the historical region series, more in, um, you know, more in depth in the the Burgundian side of the story rather than the surrounding one because all the main post Carolingian kingdoms had to do with Burgundy prepotently uh, at this time, right? So the historical Burgundy, as you understand, correlates with this border area of France, Italy, and Switzerland. Uh, the latter meaning also, as we will see in Burgundian history, having in fact an important German influence as well. Uh, it includes the major modern cities of Geneva and Lyon, so also areas that uh, are very different from a from a cultural point of view because there is still kind of the the Swiss part um, more heading towards even as that would because this is the the proper map uh, that you can see partially also from the ones they use. There is a uh, there was an original kingdom of Burgundy, the, the Romano-Germanic one. And then you have in the north, um, the northwestern part, um, specifically what would become later on detaching itself in post-Carolingian times autonomously and also kind of 
informally in the beginning as the and would become in fact such the, the duchy of Burgundy so the one that would also be incorporated within the French crown early on even though it was part of the former kingdom and on in northeast you have the county of Burgundy that bordered right uh, with the, the the capital was Besançon fundamentally uh, and um, was also sewered from from the south as we will see in the 10th century because of the autonomization of local magnates to the southeast of this um, towards uh, also uh, across the the alpine watershed into Italy the Transjurana part uh, or trans uh, Urania as, as a country overall uh, and this northeastern part altogether also expanded in Argyll right and uh, even close to Zurich and those areas so and then there is properly a the Chis Gerania with Lyon and Vienne Tarantes Grenoble that was an, an entity also uh, across the in fact the Rhone Valley because that's regionally the point of Burgundy right historically like the other Carolingian kingdoms were the Seine Basin the Rhine Basin the Po Basin Burgundy had the road and and then the south the Mediterranean part with Arles Provence right so a Mediterranean land was f uh, obviously connected mostly to the uh, to Italy at some point also with the Byzantine Empire as we will see that's where also the the Andalusian um, pirates uh, installed themselves at Fraxinetum close to Saint-Tropez from there launching raids literally in you know in northern Italy in the same Burgundy even in the Rhineland in Germany across the Alps so throughout especially this time the 10th century it is the most defining of the entire uh, say at least for, for what the kingdom of Burgundy slash Arles would have to become in the Holy Roman within the Holy Roman Empire and later on this also relatively in fact um, uh, let's say surely the centralized land that uh, everybody knew was Holy Roman Imperial legally but where France began to expand in the later Middle Ages with this broader you know uh, difficulty and di di of you know having to justify that on an international uh, base and um, and of course uh, we will see that Burgundy had um, say it was not much of a big shot as a major uh, it, it was the the smaller and weaker of the post Carolingian uh, kingdoms altogether but it had at some point an important political and institutional say at least political unity there was surely some sort of you know southeastern goal um, also with the Burgundian settlement etc some some broader identity that surely lives on in part in the uh, arguably right in, in it's a country that doesn't exist anymore right it, it's today's again France parts of Switzerland and Italy but it could be one as France Germany Italy etc do descend from those same post Carolingian kingdoms um, whereas this one at some point during the 10th century had an important shot um, for example in in, in the video about the Dutch of Burgundy I explain in detail today we will not do it because we will not descend that kind of uh, particulars but the um, there was a moment in which the count of Burgundy so that the area that would remain actually within the Holy Roman Empire um, in the properly in the kingdom of Burgundy are at a point had the possibility of recovering the duchy of Burgundy and at that time the count of Burgundy was also king of Italy and as we will see in the post Carolingian kingdoms also, also there was an important Italian interference in, on Provence that had been there since Ostrogothic and Longobard times um, uh, before this area was instead hegemonized um, with the dissolution of the Italic monarchy fundamentally by the Germanic one I said, but the, 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 the Eastern Frank is the German one if you prefer and that history that also was decided by random sometimes even just biological uh, factors like you know the birth of, of a male rather than a female or uh, somebody dying you know changing all the line of succession right that changed really entirely the history of Europe um, 
because of that, as many other events, of course, do, as they are all intertwined, but um, meaning that Burgundy at a point had a shot to consolidate into a more consistent kingdom, and it, it didn't do that, right? It was actually, like, for example, pick Western Francia, uh, what would have become France. It was the, the quickest one to disintegrate of the post-Carolingian kingdoms because the nobility was so powerful that you know, the monarchy, as you, as you know, became just one among the, the various other, you know, uh, noblemen. And uh, at a point, uh, we don't have to be, give for granted in that sense that um, the kingdom would have survived, but also France, as we know it, w would have existed. Well, in those times, where uh, also emperors, right, at least effective ones, were not elected because the Germans were still in trouble with the Magyars reigning, and hammering hard their country, the, the Magyars, the Normans, the Saracens hit all the post Carolingian kingdom, all of them, all together. Um, but in, in Italy, too, yes, there was somebody mostly, uh, also the Burgundians would do that, as we will see, um, just crowning themselves emperors because were closer to Rome, this uh, kind of local nobility, either, either um, Verona or Ivre or Spoleto, etc. But um, in, in this panorama, at, at the end of the day, Burgundy still had a shot to consolidate further, right? So the non-obvious power that at the end of the day, especially during the 11th century, uh, saw its own power dissolving, in fact, because of the empowerment of the nobility and the fact that the country hadn't managed to consolidate a strong, especially unitary institutional culture, right? As we will see also the Count of Arles with Hugo Provence, especially a very famous character. Uh, let's say fa we're failing the Transalpine policy within the same Burgundy, losing Vienne and other in, uh, Upper Burgundy, etc. Deciding to invest all in Italy. It's a bit what happened to the same German crown during the 12th to 13th century, right? Instead of consolidating North of the Alps, they prefer to go into Italy and to let basically their country, uh, say, privatizing further and essentially missing the opportunity of creating a stable national monarchy like in France or in England. So this is the broader reflection uh, as an introduction that we read these events through. Right. And so, naturally, we start with the Kingdom of the Burgundians lasting between 411 and 534. So as I was saying before, I already made a video, perhaps I will make a new one because that was pretty old, but I know that you like those kind of, um, that series about the Germanic peoples uh, specifically. Um, and so the same name of Burgundy, of course, uh, Bourgogne, and so other uh, toponyms that we find also more, more locally, of course, derives from the Germanic tribe of the Burgundians who, like, you know, especially after their settlement in the Roman Empire at a point began uh, through the local historiography and, uh, in fact, historical works, etc., to, you know, claim this uh, uh, ancient origin from Scandinavia, um, ideally settling the island of Bornholm, because in Old Norse it was known Burgundarholm, that is island of the Burgundians. Actually, we don't have much of a proof of that. Uh, as you know, I I sympathize with the idea that the Traditions Kern and the original nucleus um, of these various Germanic peoples did originate, as a matter of fact, from Scandinavia. But their cohesion was something mostly continental. Right? It happened later, and uh, surely the chieftains had uh, Scandinavian or, however, broadly Germanic origins. However. Yeah, we also have we also have many ancestors at a time. Um, the Burgundians, um, and and I explained in that video, had suffered a series of defeats pretty much throughout the entire history. Were defeated according to to the the legion by the Gepids, then they were defeated by the Vandals. Uh, this one they were still in Central Europe, right? So th their name actually seems to rather derive from. Um, at least in a general concept, from those who inhabited the highlands. So this would be the highlanders of the migration era, and that's the title, in fact, I gave it the same video before. Um, and so this defeat's already meant a lot, because normally, considering the instability of this nuclei, normally if it was defeated, 
uh, was either absorbed by another people or, or like in this case when you know they managed to go on unitarily they were somewhat depleted they were not l enormous groups so even just a, um, a major battle could sensibly uh, annihilate their their manpower in terms of you know they didn't have larger armies and tens uh, a few tens of thousands of warriors right so they however were part of that group that in 406 together with the Vandals, the, the Alans, the Suebi, etc., broke through the Rhine, um, Roman frontier, uh, in vain obstacled also by the Franks, by other peoples that are settled as Federati, in fact, in, in Gaul already, uh, and, um, and fundamentally remained, rather than entering Gaul, settled uh, by the same Romans eventually with the usual uh, negotiation in the province of Germania Secunda along the Middle Rhine, right? So this is this was their first settlement. Um, historically, they were led by the the king Juki or Jabica in the Latinized version, and this already speaks for an you know a non probably a prudent Burgundian behavior, right? The, uh, their neighbors in the northwest were the Franks that were already kind of settling Roman Gaul in part and so slightly pro-Roman uh, in, in bias and in the southeast they had the Alamanni that were that had occupied the Agri de Cumatas so the areas of roughly today's Swabia between the, the Rhine and the Danube and that were slightly said against Roman in bias and the Burgundians remained kind of in the middle as they were escaping from the Huns like those other populations and at the same time they didn't want to step so directly into Roman territory so triggering uh, either of them however around 430 their king Gunta started several um, attacks and invasions part even settlement to neighboring Gallia Belgica uh, together with the Alans that had settled in Orléans and they were fundamentally creating some local Roman puppet leaders of Gaul to kind of legitimize their own rule and so this thing was going out of hand so that the Roman general Etius with his Roman army plus Hunnic mercenaries uh, attacked the Burgundians near Worms in 436 and um, essentially destroyed them. Um, this historical event is the one giving origin effectively to the the Belungan lead poem that as you know reemerges in literature later on in the Middle Ages and is quite um, romanticized in many ways it, the, the, the massacre of the Burgundians takes place in Vienna at Attila's court because of treachery etc so this deeply ingrained Hunnic memory let's say uh, say this, the memory of Hunnic trauma rather in, among the Germanic populations um, but uh, there are many hints that make us think that the figure of Attila there is actually the one of Etzius uh, per se and so mostly what had happened at the hands of the Romans but also the Huns that surely were here not just Attila but also many groups many bands though, such as the same German ones that at the time you find either from the Roman, from the Hunnic side at the same time. Um, and um, so this Middle Rhine kingdom was destroyed and the remaining Burgundians were settled by the Romans from 443 onwards uh, in that uh, area, in fact, it lays between the Alps and the Rhone Valley, establishing properly the the barbarian kingdom of the Burgundians. Uh, the area more specifically would be Sapaudia or Sepaudia, right? That also gives the name to the modern region of Savoy, but actually it's not quite the same overlapping territorially speaking, but more or less, of course, it was encompassed by the, by the Burgundians. It also settled uh, in other areas. You know that Burgundians were among um, at th in this period especially among some of the most Romanized Romano-Germanic kingdoms right they issued the Lex Burgundionum the Lex Romana Burgundionum that is one of the most famous early Germanic law code that together with the Visigothic ones is essentially 
he wants to train in the, the greatest um, Roman influence among them. And um, so this, this the broader era was the, the Roman province of uh, Maxima Sequanorum, right? Um, and they, um, they dwelled here essentially as a, as we've seen, as a defeated people initially until the same Roman government evaporated from the area, so they tried to autonomize themselves more. The problem is that, at that point, there were much more powerful Romano-Germanic kingdoms around. In the north, you had the Franks that were essentially crushing everybody around under Clovis, starting from the, the Alamanni and uh, the, in fact, the kingdom of Siagris in Soissons, the last Roman stronghold, or say, Roman su successor state in uh, in, in the Sand Basin where eventually the same Merovingian kingdom would prosper. In the east they had the Ostrogothic kingdom that uh, was one of the major powers at the time and that also retained uh, the control of Provence and this was the important point because the Rhone River flows in the Mediterranean in Provence so by controlling its mouth you control the, uh, the traffics that were quite important because they would remain historically, you know, that the Rhone Valley prospered economically, especially in the high middle ages, um, because it was just like an, a major trade highway uh, in Europe between, say, connecting the north of, say, the, the, the Flemish towns and, and the Champagne Fair with the, the Italian city state. So, until the Hundred Years War, this remained, uh, you know, a, a very prosperous area, right? The Rhone Valley, specifically, because the, what would become Burgundy, also in the north and in, in the in the French uh, kingdom, w was also very fertile and prosperous, mostly because of local agricultural resources. Famously enough, think about the wine um, and more. And this other area in the south, instead, was uh, deeply Romanized, was heavily urbanized and prosper for many other reasons, but mostly because of these uh, trade contacts. So the uh, relatively defiled um, position of the Burgundians at that time between the Franks from one side, the Goths from another, uh, is eloquent about this series of defeats that the people had suffered before. In fact, the only true attrition they had, um, let's say, as a an attempt of experience Expansionist, uh, expansionism was against the Visigothic kingdom, so towards the southwest, um, because of you know the, the Visigothic kingdom was huge, and this was kind of a, a more peripheral area, and they were essentially battling over kind of southern cities, right in the uh, what would be the Roman provinces of Narbonensis Prima, uh, the Viennensis, the Narbonensis Secunda, that were. Uh, in, uh, on the Mediterranean, controlled by the gods, right? And also there, the, the Burgundians wouldn't make much of a headway on. Um, so it goes without saying that the Franks, that were quickly expanding f from their extremely uh, wealthy and populated Atlantic plains, um, and becoming de facto the major power in Europe, wanted to have, um, wanted to reach the Mediterranean. Right. Eventually, the Merovingian kingdom would contract, so it's not until the Carolingian times that you know the, the Mediterranean would be reached, uh, Italy would be conquered, and all these things, and the Western Roman Empire restored. So the Byzantines, as you know, also during their reconquest, feared pretty much what was going on with the Franks more more than else. Um, but in during the the, the 6th century, where the Merovingians were still quite powerful under Clovis um, and his immediate successor, Burgundy was uh, essentially incorporated. And it, it was a difficult task because uh, the area is quite composite territorially, so you have the Alps from one side, the Massif Central from, from another, and so also this massive stronghold represented by the Roman cities with their uh, ring, with their stone walls, etc. So even the Franks had quite a, you know, gra just could gradually expand in the air because it was somewhat distant and waging war uh, 
on those um, on those measures was 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 an important thing that they could afford to do at that time uh, before contracting in the end. And so um, in um, 523, the sons. So the, the, there had already been naturally some clashes, right, of frontier, right. But in, it's only in 523 that the sons of Clovis the First campaigned in the Burgundian lands. Mm-hmm. Um, consider the original. This was the uh, again a composite territory, also compared to what had been the originary major provinces of the empire here we're talking about the late ones the the, the ones set up by the diocletian that were smaller but say um gallia belgica arrived to the south to the lands of the sequani right and then only south to the lugdunensis and that era was pretty much connected in fact with the sand basin and so um this kind of crescent that stretches from our market to in fact the Saint the Saint Alps that um, the Franks would would use also as, as a major power base a logistical base to wage war elsewhere so Burgundy was just on there right on the way south and that's why it would be incorporated integrated um, properly in the in in the Frankish uh, uh, core power Right, differently, f- for example, from Aquitaine or Alamannia, right? The the Carolingian Empire is effectively a Frankish Burgundian Empire, and the reason because it was that, of course, in this northern part, especially uh, from the, the central European watershed, was easy to to annex that part, right? The, the problem was the Mediterranean watershed because it was more difficult to reach at that point. Um, so, at this point, the the Merovingians had a grievance towards the uh, the the Burgundian king Gundobad because he had assassinated Kilperic II. These were different brothers who were contending uh, power because the Burgundians, by the way, were fighting, of course, also among one another in the process. And he had also drowned uh, Kilperic's wife, and their children fled right uh, to the uh, to the Frankish court so much that, uh, especially Kilperic's daughter Clotilde would marry Clovis I, right? And she and her sons were seeking for revenge uh, out of Gundobad's killing of their ancestors. So um, the in a, in a first clash, Gundobad was defeated and his power reduced significantly. And in 532, the Burgundians were decisively defeated altogether by the Franks at Autron. You can hear um, the the Burgundian king Godemard was Gundobad's son was attacked both by the Franks and an uh, internal Burgundian faction that had sided also against Gundobad. Um, and uh, this is when two years later the Burgundian lands are annexed by the Frankish Empire proper. And so Burgundy ceases to be an independent power. There had been some, uh, there, there would always remain some sort of autonomy, right? Considered that the land was deeply Romanized, even later on when the Longobards invaded Italy, at some point they crossed the Alps into Burgundy because they initially were just, you know, expanding. And we know still some Roman officers that were part of the Burgundian army that also successfully ambushed the longer birds and uh, kicked them out back to the other side of the Alps uh, and, um, and and so we, we see also through the Burgundian administration this important uh, of course romance prevalence right much more than in the north of Gaul right that remained as a distinct land um, in many ways so of course towards the, the sixth century um, and just after the pose of Dagobert during the 7th, uh, the Frankish power shrinks, like effectively you have four different Frankish kingdoms that are all fighting against one another, right? They're basically Neustria, Austrasia, Burgundy, and Aquitaine that all border at some point as, as quarters at, you know, at the center, and from there they always fight against one another. And there are, in fact... Um, several rulers of the Frankish Merovingian dynasty between 600 
uh, actually 561, 592, and between 639 and 737, we use the title of King of Burgundy, right? Because uh, that was, yes, was a regnum, was the, the, the local Burgundian leaders were right, recognized as regis, and this was a way for Burgundy naturally to, uh, from, from, from one side to maintain um, a, an important political institutional continuity uh, as a country, even though as a subject one, but in fact in the process also undergoing an important uh, in fact, uh, measure of Frankization. You have essentially Frankish Burgundian uh, leadership and uh, especially speaking of the north, uh, an incorporation in the broader Frankish world. That also explains how later on, for example, the Dutch of Burgundy in the northwest would be part of the Kingdom of France uh, from the various Carolingian repartitions, and but the rest remained kind of a distant thing uh, at the same time. Um, so, um, so th this era, by the way, what the Burgundians had been Aryans, but they quickly Catholicized without too much trouble, differently from, for example, the Visigoths um, or the Alamanni that remained um, pagan uh, until the the, sand, the 8th century. And they, they're more developed, right, infrastructurally, um, they have more cities, they have more agricultural resources, they are in the Mediter Mediterranean. And they, mm, again, they're under the, Car the, the Merovingians and the, and the Carolingians, but they are a relevant political and strategic entity. And the local rulers would have a new chance of autonomization, but we're talking essentially about Carolingians or families married into the Carolingian dynasty, as we will see, to autonomize, starting from the, uh, in fact, late Carolingian partitions of the of the broader empire, in which Burgundy reaffirmed itself as um, as an entity. So, the the first one starts with Middle Francia, which was created after the 843. Treaty of Verdun, after the, the clashes, uh, the blo very bloody clashes among the children of Louis the Pius. So you know what we're talking about. It included lands from the North Sea to Southern Italy and was ruled by the most important of the of an, an heir of an imperial heir of Louis the Pius, Lothar the First, right? Uh, and um, Burgundy was included in this. Right, the um, at this point the northwestern part of the former Burgundian lands was though included in the kingdom of West Francia as the Duchy of Burgundy, as we were talking about uh, in that video and, and also before, with its capital in Dijon. Um, so this was not even technically yet the Duchy of mm, fully institutionalized as such because the titles of uh, comitatus, ducatus, etc. in Carolingian times was still going back and forth depending on, you know, what what power the ruler was invested by. We would sediment as a duchy because it would settle as a duchy because exactly the frontier nature and thus the strategic one with uh, the that's not mostly the county of Burgundy but properly the, an, an entity that was felt as different from West Francia. So Middle Francia. Uh, Middle Francia, whatever you want to call it, um, was, um, as you know, an, a, a quite composite entity made up, uh, as we will see from the later splits of Lotharingia in the north, so from essentially the North Sea to, to the Alps, then Burgundy, and the Kingdom of Italy, from which, you know, the emperor ruled uh, with the capital of Pavia, and especially Rome that confirmed the imperial title and this original repartition had been wanted by Louis de Pius because um, essentially there according to him there that they had a great sense of the uh, imperial unitary continuity there had to be a ruler governing both Rome and Aachen right the latter being at least in Charlemagne's plain the, the Rome of the north having uh, a massive symbolical uh, importance right um, but this entity was short-lived, 
and uh, in fact, b right before his death in 855, Lothar, uh, Lothar the First divided his kingdom among his three sons in three parts: Lotharingia, the kingdom of Italy, and the regions of Lower Burgundy and Provence, or Cisjuran Burgundy, how how you want to call it. And the latter were specifically left to the youngest son, right? So the were the considered as the, the less important, that's known as Charles of Provence, or Charles II, um, who actually died at 18, and as we will see, was a personally an ineffective ruler under the, uh, the guidance of the Count Gerard II of Vienne. Um, and this partition would create more conflicts than, than anything, right? Uh, mostly because Lotharingia, that at some point was ruled as um, a broader entity, was seen by the Western Frankish and Eastern Frankish rulers as basically an inheritance of, her, uh, of theirs. Um, surely, as you know, Lotharingia was uh, technically also another of the possible countries that could have evolved from, from the, Car the Carolingian Empire repartition, but it objectively was the one lacking the most any form of, of, of particular unity, right? If you look at, there, would, there is an import, I made videos about the Carolingian repartitions, etc., and there, is, there was really nothing teleological, um, especially in the early repartitions that you find having occurred since a very long time, even, I don't know, at the time of Charlemagne and Carloman, etc., that were somewhat non-obvious compared to the modern states in Europe that, that we know um, today. Um, and th that must be understood because, um, in fact, we don't have to give for granted, even though there was some broader division between, for example, the Romance and the Germanic-speaking areas that we would have had, as we were saying before, like you have just France from one side, Germany from another. There were also entities that would kind of evolve in that sense. Maybe the, the true heirs of Lotharingia and the centralized fashion are the lowlanders, right? Today's Belgium, the, the Benelux, right? Luxembourg, uh, the Netherlands. And this, in fact, uh, is what made them existing um, in, in the first place. Um, but also naturally because of the limits of the various rulers, right? For example, I don't know, the Western, the, the Eastern Frankish kings ruled mostly from Southern Germany at the time, from Regensburg, and they were very interested, especially in the Eastern frontier. So that area laid from on the other direction. The, the Western Frankish kings also had more than what France has today in the North, especially think about Belgium, that is a relatively, uh, you know, recent, um, creation, so it, it's a it's complicated, and teleologically, again, you you will probably not get very far when looking at all the things that that, that actually happened for <laughs> for making modern countries happening, uh, and and quite randomly so, in in some in some instances. Burgundy, instead, at least in this context, had a bit more of a cohesion. On its own, again, it's their own basin, right? Whereas Lotharingia is just again this middle land with, without much of a previous, even properly political reality. It's not that it was a, a people that inhabited there. It was a mix of Austrasians, Frisians, Saxons, Western Frank. I mean, it was pretty messed up. Um, but it would be incorporated, as you know, later on, however, in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, rather, would be part of the Holy Roman Empire, mm -hmm. not among the Western Franks. And this because of still the, the, the power that the, the Eastern Frankish Kingdom acquired, especially during the 10th century, but already from quite soon, let's say, the, the, it was mostly the Western Frankish um, disgregation that brought to that, if anything, not much of a much greater Eastern Frankish control, especially in the ninth century, where the, the monarch was uh, at least in the late one, when the monarch was still far from re reviving, like under the Ottonians in in the in the following one. So this is perhaps unnecessary, but um, it, it's relevant to Burgundy because, as we will see at a point, 
uh, now the Burgundians supported the Lotharingian rulers because they hoped in that way to fragment further the transalpine reality to avoid interference and injurance over them, right? Um, and this was already even at, at the time of uh, of the young uh, Charles uh, of Provence under the the government of Count Girard II, right? Uh, Girard his wife was the sister-in-law of Emperor Lothar I. So these are all figures, uh, as we will see also as the Bosonids that would later rule Burgund Burgundy Arl, married into the Carolingians and or descending from them, etc. And Girard was, was actually a strong regent. He succeeded in defending the land from the Vikings, who raided as far as Valence. He also fought against the Saracens. However, Charles' uncle, Charles the Bald, that had become, in fact, Western Frankish king, and later he would be emperor, and was the last of the uh, generation of Louis the Pious' children, attempted to intervene in Provence in 861 after having received an, an appeal uh, for help from the Count of Arles that, uh, as we've seen, was in the southernmost like, uh, area, in the, the mouth of, 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 the, of the Rhone, and that was also kind of a powerful center, but autonomizing further from the rest of Provence, also from, the, from Upper Burgundy, uh, as, as an entity already, because these kingdoms altogether were already giving signs of the composition of this gradation. So Charles the Bald invaded the same Provence, reaching as far as Mahon, before being restrained, however, by the Archbishop Ingmar of Rheims, who said, watch that, because that's your relative's possession. You are a king. You, you can't, they are in their own regard, so you can't do that. And so this already shows how, naturally, Western Frankie was, at that point, well, still unitary by name, even though this gregation, as we made several videos and this already was already beginning under in, in this circumstances, the, the most powerful entity. So, so Burgundy had always known that this is, those were Charles was ruling from the Charles the Bald from the Seine Basin. Again, these were the Franks again reasserting control on the Burgundian uh land. Yeah, that's that's the point. And in eight hundred fifty eight, Count Girard uh, arranged uh, that should Charles of Provence die without heirs, the kingdom of Provence would revert to Charles' older brother Lothar II, who was ruler of Lotharingia. Mm -hmm. um, as we will see, Charles, as I said before, Charles died quite young uh, in 863. But at this point, uh, Louis II his oldest brother, king of Italy, claimed Provence for himself. So at this point, the kingdom of Burgundy was divided between Lothar II and Louis II. Right? Lothar uh, received the bishoprics of Lyon, Vienne, and Grenoble, so in the north, from, from Lotharingia, that were, however, to be governed uh, by Girard in a decentralized way because Lotharingia didn't have much of a power at that point while Louis of Italy received Arles, Aisans, Provence and Embrun that were much more easily accessible from, from the Mediterranean and so also the richest areas, the, the most urbanized, the more commercially profitable that were controlled from, from the Longobard Kingdom. This is an important settlement because it already shows how Burgundy was, in a sense, permeable to, uh, w was still, of course, permeable before the big crack, the final crack of the Carolingian Empire, to the other powerful, more powerful chunks, right? And um, especially after the death of Lothar II, that we can further uh, the Lotharingian power base, 
the 870 Treaty of Mersen allotted the northern part of former Middle Francia to King Louis the German, so that uh, historically that was incorporated in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, while Burgundy practically split between Charles the Bald of Western Francia and the Italic Kingdom as well. Right, so uh, this is an interesting moment because you have mm, Lyon and Vienne in theory passing under the say within the Western Frankish orbit. In the south, basically this barely reaches the Mediterranean and the Arles Provence pass to the Kingdom of Italy. And interestingly enough, the Rhone um, River is the border between the two. This is interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, because this would become, historically, during the late Middle Ages, the same boundary of, between the Kingdom of France and the Holy Roman Empire. After uh, another way, a, a story of Burgundian unit that had still managed to, to control the right bank of, of their own, with Lyon in the end being actually part of still of the Kingdom of Burgundy later on. But this situation had already represented itself. It's, and it's also interesting for another reason, because up to the, um, like normally, this as soon as the the uh, the Longobards had settled in Italy, uh, normally the Franks, uh, through Burgundy, controlled um, the uh, beyond the Alpine watershed, towards the Italian side, right, in, in the Italian valleys fundamentally, because the Franks were more powerful than the Longobards, and so this was the case. It was like just Longobards with the Bavarians, right? The Longobards were more powerful, so they controlled into the Danubian watershed over the Bavarians. Um, instead, here you have actually a kingdom of Italy that manages to control a wide area, even reaching as far as the Lake of Lausanne, Right and including Arles, Marseille, um, almost up to Septimania, practically, and this also reflected the older um, Ostrogothic and Longobard ambitions in Provence. For example, at the time of Charles Martel, um, the Frankish king had called the Longobard army against the Saracens in southern Gaul, and uh, and the Longobards intervened, and they they had an interesting projectional capacity in Provence as well. Right? So that's an area where, um, a, let's say, when the Frankish power was kind of contracting, normally Italy would intervene in, right? Whereas normally when a when there is a strong France, the, the the objective is for it to invade Italy, as it had happened with Charlemagne, with the same uh, Pippin the Short before, etc. Uh, but this reflects those kind of um, thermometrically, let's say, that those kind of political ratios of, of power during this very, very turbulent and chaotic, frankly, uh, phases that we will see now really are, are, are quite messed up also in, for, for us to define an actual formal institution of, um, um, of, of the same kingdom of Burgundy are. In fact, while the formal creation of the Kingdom of Arles, Burgundy, um, so the one eventually would dwell in the, in, within the Holy Roman Empire, dates to 933, when Upper and Lower, say, properly Burgundy and Provence were unified, as we will see, under a single rule. Uh, the fact that this area was already autonomous after the death of Louis the Stammer, that is, um, the son of Charles the Bald, in 879. Right. At this point, there was an incredibly fascinating, exceptional, and, and powerful figure, that is, the Western Frankish Count Bozo of Provence. Um, Bozo was an, a nobleman of, of the Bosonet family, who rose to prominence at the point of becoming king of Lower Burgundy and Provence at the same time. Um, this, these were powerful individuals, right? They were endowed with monasteries, they were married in, into royalty, and um, his sister had married Charles the Bald, 
who at that point um, entrusted Bozo with the control of uh, the county of Lyon, of Vian, uh, also replacing some former rulers uh, there. And he was elected Chamberlain, uh, Magister Osteriorum, Master of Porters, uh, to Charles Hare, Louis. Um, he had an enormous power. At some point, Charles invested him as Missus Dominicus for Italy, an incredible power, right? He elevated him to the rank of Duke, providing him with military force as well. He became Governor Count of Provence in 877. He was even adopted as papal son in 878 because of uh, the, the support that he had provided um, in, in Italy. And so we're talking about an incredible figure who, after the death of Louis the Stammer, also began in the, in the Car within the Carolingian lands to, to influence broader political processes, uh, including the succession of Louis the Stammer's son, Louis III, that he wanted just to uh, rule as sole uh, sovereign that instead was uh, cited by the, the brother Carloman II. But interestingly enough, at some point, Bozo styled himself De Grazia id quod sum, Emperor. That is to say, by the grace of God, he, he thought to be an emperor. This is extremely interesting because he clothed uh, this this claim uh, through the idea that this was the former emperor's will, but it's still part of a broader mentality that a Frankish nobleman could have at the time in identifying the imperium properly in those who owned them rather than you know the way it had been dynasticized. Uh, but he was becoming so powerful, he controlled basically um, most of the, the entirety of, of the kingdom, right? Uh, Arles, uh, Aix-en-Provence, Vienne, uh, Lyon, probably even Vézanson and the diocese of Tarentaise, Ouse and Vivier in, in, in the north. So um, an enormous power to the point that the next and old Carolingian emperor, Charles III, also known as the Fat, decided to depose him. He first besieged him in Vienne in 884, from August to November, and the siege failed. Proving again that the, the, there are a few sieges in Carolingian military history because most of Europe didn't have much of a thick urban net, but in, in this Burgundian south, there was Vienne was. Uh, a major Roman city. But still, uh, in August 802, Bozo was besieged at Vienne by his brother, Richard the Justiciar, Duke of Burgundy. So you see here what the connections that had already formed between an area that was Western Frankish, like the Duchy of Burgundy, it was emerging as such, and the, the South. Um, Richard was also Count of uh, Auton, the would be eventually incorporated in the Duchy of Burgundy later on. And and he took the city in September. At that point, Bozo never regained much of his realm, was restricted to the county of Vienne. And this was significant for Burgundy altogether because um, it meant other um, other powers fundamentally emerging from from within from within the same country, mostly autonomously by some magnates like it was going on in in the Carolingian Empire altogether, all because of the crumbling of central authority, uh, for which the um, that much power was regained as a unitary land, right before it ended up definitely under Germanic uh, control. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's significant also that Bozo had established most of his power already in the lower Burgundy, in this Ch uh, Chisgurania, uh, at Arles specifically, that would gain, in fact, um, momentum as the, the, the favored center, but at that point was not established as such by the Burgundian rulers, 
but another center of power was forming in the county of Burgundy in the northeast from the rule of the most powerful magnate in Upper Burgundy, in fact, the Count Rudolf of Auxerre, that had inherited from his father the lay of abbacy of Saint Maurice uh, en Valais, um, and um, essentially ruling mostly present day Switzerland and what would have become the Franche Comte. Right, and he was, because of this northern position, also mostly involved in Transalpine affairs, like with the, mostly with the kingdom of... Uh, uh, first, at a point, he he claimed the wall of Lotharingia for himself, right? Um, in, and he even managed to occupy much of modern Lorraine and Alsace in the process, but this was contested by the Eastern Frankish ruler Arnulf of Carinthia, who forced him to, to abandon Lotharingia and to you know, in exchange actually for recognition as King of Burgundy, that however was contended as we will see now by other powers. Um, but again, the, the the areas that we were defining at the beginning of the videos are being created uh, at this point. In the meanwhile, Provence was instead ruled by the son and successor of Bozo, known as Louis the third actually is Holy Roman Emperor because of his Italian uh, adventure that however would make him pass to history mostly as Louis the Blind because he was in fact um, punished uh, in the process. This Provencal uh, special interest in Italy is essentially the main divide with, from Upper Burgundy right in, in broader uh, geographical orientation, uh, we can say. And Louis was invited in Italy because he was the grandson and heir of the Emperor Louis II. Um, and there was a strong party supporting him, especially the one of the of Adalbert II, Margrave of Tuscany, because uh, mostly of the security needs posed by the ravages of the Magyars that uh, the rule of Berengar the first of uh, of Friuli that was also Holy Roman Emperor because of this various coronations in Rome but had not been able to stem. Uh, Louis had coped against the the Saracens with with the, with, with the Saracens in in Burgundy uh, he at this point they had already established their base at Fraxinet in 889 in the Gulf of Saint-Tropez uh, and uh, at a point there were Magyars and Saracens fighting against Burgundians most time, but the, of course the perspective of ruling the Kingdom of Italy was much more kind of uh, alluring, much more interesting for, for Louis, who in fact traveled, he, he crossed the Alps, he defeated Berengar, chasing him from Pavia, the old Longobard and, and capital where he received in the Church of St. Michael the crown, the Iron Crown of Lombardy and that was necessary for if going to Rome where in fact uh, he was in 901, the, the following year uh, crowned Emperor by Pope Benedict IV. However, there was not much that Louis could do against the Magyar incursions at that point so that the Italian nobility uh, sided quickly again uh, with Berengar of Friuli, who in 902 uh, imposed Louis uh, not to return right uh, from Provence anymore. However, three years later, Louis was called in Italy back again by uh, the Marquis Adalbert of Ivrea, that, by the way, is just across the Alps in Piedmont, so that, that's also an area that would be connected in the in fact, in this 10th, 11th century, the same Duchy of Savoy and its uh, crossing from, from the French to the Italian side historically and in its territorial composition dates to, launched another attempt to invade the Italic kingdom, right? And he managed to expel from the capital Pavia again, Berenger, and, and even marching and on and taking 
Verona, that was the stronghold right in the northeast of, of Berengar. Uh, and um, it was here we cannot get into the details, but there were naturally different factions supporting both sides. However, Berengar returned from his German exile accompanied by Bavarian troops and he had entered Verona by you know surprise he uh, essentially uh, trapped Louis in the sanctuary uh, at the church of St. Peter and finally he captured him and he had his eyes put out for having broken the oath of, of not coming back to Italy again. So as you understand, also because of the necessary fitness that, uh, that an emperor, a ruler, a, a monarch of any uh, status must had, um, without eyes, Louis, uh, Louis' career was over. So that he had to come back to Provence. Uh, he had his capital in Vienne, Right, and this is where uh, he entrusted the rule of Provence to his cousin, Hugh, um, who would rise, as we will see now, to to prominence uh, f uh, in uh, in the lo in the local administration. And would attempt, first of all, to recompose the Burgundian power, and when failing, instead turning towards Italy again. The history of Hugo of Arles is actually very complicated because, um, especially with Italian um, policy that uh, was extremely uh, perturbed by the local uh, events, and we cannot get in thorough detail about this, but he is still important as, as a Provencal ruler because he pursued a broader imperial um, uh, policy, right? Uh, for Burgundy, the most important aspect is that um, he tried uh, at some point to deprive Rudolf II of Upper Burgundy, the son of Rudolf I, of his northern territories to essentially reunite, in fact, both trans and cis Juran Burgundy. But this attempt failed um, also because there were you know other uh, other powers such as the the, the son of Char uh, of um, of Louis the Blind Charles Constantine who ruled from Vienne and you would enter the Italian policies for the same reasons that had brought his cousin as uh, Berengar of Ivrea was still around uh, and the Italian nobility had revolted yet again against him uh, at this point electing Rudolf the second of Upper Burgundy as their king, right? Um, the in in response to this, you decided to invade Italy instead, um, and claiming the throne of Italy for, for himself. And this was all connected naturally with the the competition that was occurring uh, in the same Burgundy for the control of the entire country as well. Um, Rudolf saw that the Italian situation was more complicated than it seemed, especially for his own possibilities. Um, and he, he realized that Hugh was much more interested naturally in the Italic kingdom uh, and also better placed because he was ruling from Arles uh, and he was much more, much better connected properly. Um, also the other the Mediterranean with, with Rome, with Tuscany that was also necessary to cross to, to get to Rome, etc. So the two sides um, came to an, an agreement for which Rudolf uh, relinquished all his rights to Italy in exchange for the unification in 933, as we've seen before, of the upper and lower Burgundy. That is to say, the Trans-Jurana and the uh, Cis-Jurana, uh, the, the latter of which uh, essentially was just a continental part. Vienne, Lyon, that you let Rudolf occupy successfully for good. Uh, and thus, 
uh, winning instead the italic crown for for himself, right? And this brought again in the broader political geography the compaction of a more kind of continental part of Burgundy and the one instead of Provence Arles that historically as we will see will also be ruled by several other rulers including even the Catalans etc uh, now the history of Hugh in Italy is of relative um, importance for let's say such a brutal synthesis on the Burgundian affairs let's just say that um, Provence benefited from this connection because uh, uh, Hugh's uh, government brought in Provence much of you know Italian administrative practices. This is confirmed by the documents in the royal chancery. Uh, Hugh's control of Italy was quite tormented. He uh, occupied at different times Tuscany, then Milan, then Rome, and at the end of the day, he was overthrown from all of these places for, for different reasons. He tried to establish also a connection with the Byzantine Empire, sending his daughter as supposed to the Byzantine Emperor. He also married the famed uh, Marosha in Rome, uh, and uh, by, by this son he was expelled actually, say steps on in that uh, what he was concerned. From, from the same Rome he had to escape uh, you know, Castel Sant'Angelo with, with a robe, because essentially the Roman people revolted against the, the occupation of the, the Provencal troops. Um, however, Hugh's rule in Italy was, um, you know, was at some point effective. He managed, for example, to stem the plague of the Magyar incursions, not completely, but still with, with an important degree of success. He tried to administrate also thanks to his provincial possessions were added in the game and not just the the, the italic ones kind of a broader administrative uniformity and kind of development of the sense of the you know of the the unity of of the italic kingdom but again different sides fought against him um, continuously berenger of ivrea fought against him he tried to to abolish his mark in the first place he was a very messed up situation and we'll have to talk about this in some in some specific video because the history is quite big and important and should be known instead it's one of those relatively um, less known chapters in medieval history um, rather like you know there is kind of some gossiping about the situation in Rome um, uh, etc but the truth being that it was an entire kingdom at stake and also an imperial title. At the end of the day, however, uh, you uh, had to, to resign from the Italic crown because he was from the Itali Italic monarchy because he was tired, old, etc. And this was a massive opposition. But we know that when he died in 947, he was recruiting a new army in Arles to invade Italy yet again. So, um, the, the political compaction of Lower and Upper Burgundy, as we've seen, so this core area was perceived still somewhat separated from the, uh, the, the south of Arles and the, most, the Mediterranean Stripe, um, would have um, consequences um, historically. Rudolf II, in fact, had uh, received an important German support by the time Hugh was uh, operating in Italy because although he had unified, as we've seen, the, the continental areas under his control, he was not as powerful as his rival still. And the Eastern Frankish interference in the, uh, in the Burgundian affairs at that point would, would have not but uh, increased uh, fundamentally. Rudolf was succeeded by his son, Conrad the Peaceful, Right, which refers to the fact that he objectively didn't create much international trouble and on the contrary he sought uh, the um, increasing support of Emperor Otto the, the First. Um, Conrad ruled um, 
at the same time, by the way, of of, you, of of Arl, that at this point was kind of, however, coming back a little bit by claiming inheritance still on the Burgundian lands in spite of the agreement of 933. So that's why the, the Ottonians step in the in, in Burgundy by also posing themselves as the, the guardians of that, of that order and basically uh, cutting out our from, from from the rest of, of the continental areas that's very important there were still hard times Conrad had to fight at, at a point against uh, joint Saracen and Magyar uh, attack considered that the same Ottonians albeit fighting against the Magyars were essentially negotiating their their Italian uh, policy with with the Caliph a uh, of Cordoba, especially as far as the presence of the base of Fraxinetum was concerned. Essentially, this base remained there as long as um, it, it received protection by the caliphs. Where this began to decline uh, by the 11th century was taken out by the Council of Provence without too much um, much further ado. Let's say if you wonder why this was going on, consider that there were many Provencal noblemen that were also siding with the Saracens because objectively the base of Fraxinetum opened them to to the you know to markets that stretch from from the Atlantic to Southeast Asia, and so you know they they cared about the say public authority only up to a certain point. Conrad was succeeded by his um, son. Rudolf the Third of or Burgundy, called the Idol or or the Pius, um, and he was the last member of the Burgundian group of the Elder House of Belf. During his reign, uh, he essentially entered in contrast with some of his vassals um, regarding the control on some um, on some investitures, namely the one uh, on the Archbishop of Besançon that was the most important city as we were saying before properly in the in the county of burgundy um, and at that point uh, as an arbiter uh, henry the emperor henry the second the Ottonian, at the beginning of the 11th century stepped in he met with uh, rudolf in uh, strasbourg um, and um, he succeeded in negotiating with um, with him to name him as his successor, right? This was confirmed at the Diet of, of Mainz in 1018, albeit, um, you know, the broader legitimacy of this um, of of this agreement was naturally uh, attacked by the Burgundian nobility that instead was enjoying exactly that moment an important degree of autonomy and the germans stepping in would have been um you know a problem for them however uh, rudolf the third died without surviving uh, hey issue and so uh, this brought to the succession of henry the second to the kingdom of burgundy as well this is how Henry's successor, that was the Emperor Conrad II from the Salian dynasty, that had fundamentally stemmed from still from a essentially a, a in fact a Franconian Saxon background, incorporated um, the kingdom of, uh, of Burgundy Arl altogether in the Holy Roman Empire. So that this uh, say major power how the, the Holy Roman Empire had been consolidating during those generations was able to essentially affirm its own rights altogether on on this entity and the county of Arles in the south was also incorporated altogether especially after the decline of, of the Saracens and the the general stabilization of imperial power in Germany and in Italy there was no way this entity could you know still claim any other kind of uh, you know of supremacy in, in the area like as, as Provence uh, altogether so it was simply absorbed within the system and this naturally there were counts of art that still ruled in a kind of uh, autonomous and at, at a point also with the 
the intermittent imperial presence in a de facto independent way, right? There was there, as we were saying before, also uh, a strong Catalan influence. We know it just just even from the name of the count, who they were, of course, what connections they they had. Um, so this uh, centers in Mediterranean were also acquiring, as you know, an, an important degree of autonomy, if not as maritime powers, and specifically in this case, but still with a, an intense um, traffic and the kind of properly connection with um, uh, the coastal dimension of of the Mediterranean, which is different even sometimes from a few tens of of, of kilometers in the interland, right? Um, so from this moment on, albeit the kingdom's territories uh, operated with considerable autonomy, the emperors, uh, the Holy Roman emperors, held the title of kings of Arles, right? Which had even surpassed Burgundy in uh, in power. Considered that that Arles had been the sea of the prefectures of, of the Gauls after Trier had been moved because of the threat posed by the, by the barbarian invasions. So uh, at a point, this city had control, namely at least from you know all what the Romans could, could claim from from Scotland to Morocco in the westernmost fort um, of, of the empire. Right. So we're talking about massive. I don't know if you have ever visited Provence or Arles. They're beautiful places. Are massive infrastructure the, the arena the the um this is typical of provence altogether the very strong r romanized aspect of it right and there were at some point specific revivals also of the of the title because again of the the intermittency of um of, of the imperial presence itself for example Conrad II received its uh, the the crown of the kingdom twice. First at the Payern Abbey, uh, and then after, by the way, repelling a challenge from Otto II of Blois at the Geneva Cathedral. Right, Frederick Barbarossa uh, held uh, a diet in Vesanson in 1157. And in 1178 was crowned King of Burgundy by the Archbishop of Arles. So, in a sense, reuniting symbolically the northern and the southern uh, historical capitals of, of, of the kingdom. Right? And especially during the 12th century, 11th to the 12th, this area via the Holy Roman Emperors kind of saw a reactivation, for example, of public um a public uh, authority right the the attempt from the germanic rulers to revive a bit to inject f further blood in the veins of, of the, the 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 older kingdom uh, that uh, naturally at this point was as we've seen had hadn't had really a unitary administrative tradition exactly because of this and and the reason being probably that burgundy was uh of course, it, it was a more modest kingdom than both Germany and Italy. But exactly because of this, it was just by controlling the cities, the, 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 the Rhone Valley, and um, you know, exercising an important pressure also in the northern part from, from Germany. So without the, the Alpine watershed, could, say, give them um, a Mediterranean uh, opening. And... Uh, the um, the lack of a strong uh, uh, centralized or decentralized uh, political presence that was somewhat in between in both sides uh, could favor that uh, monarchic revival. Diplomas were issued, uh, justice was ad administered. Naturally, most of the times the Holy Roman Emperor were, were elsewhere, right? Preferably in Germany and Italy. But um, this kingdom was was crucial, and it still offered also the the possibility of expanding further, having a footstep, for example, in France geographically, even though it was something separated, but still um, affirming the presence of the empire in that region. While at this point the French were 
um, were still you know, fundamentally in the Ile-de-France and in a few other areas directly controlled by, by the Capetian dynasty. Um, however, on the long run, as you know, the Holy Roman Empire wouldn't be quite centralized, so an order thing could start from, from Burgundy, frankly. Uh, that was not a sufficient power base for, for an imperial policy. It just would help. Um, so there was a lack of interest, especially from from the 13th century onwards, when uh, the, 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 the German monarchy crumbled and the French one uh, took off. Uh, it, it was obvious that instead the, the tide had turned. And so actually the, the Capetians began to annex some territories of the of the Burgundian kingdom, starting from the uh, the Vivare Sea of Vivier, that was formally recognized in 1306. As we were saying at the beginning of the video, it was a broader ambiguity because, again, everybody knew that, that Burgundy was the emperor's legally, right? But given the difficulties of the German crown, gradually those rights could be sold in exchange for recognition of power, right? Uh, the Lyonnais, for example, had been practically beyond the reach of the empire since the late 12th century, and as we were saying before, at the time of the uh, Mersenne partition, those lands had already belonged to Western Frank, yeah, so there had been a precedent even. Um, so the incorporation into France of that specific area uh, resulted out of internal conflicts between the Archbishop of Lyon the cathedral chapter and the city council that paved the way to some greater authority that came to, to make order there. Um, and it was cemented, the, the, status, the, the state was cemented in the early 14th century and formalized in a 1312 treaty between the Archbishop Peter of Savoy and Philip IV of France. And at this point, the Holy Roman Emperor was Henry VII, that was also the uh, the first one after uh, after Conradin of Swabia took to wage an Italian expedition that at that point was threatening the same French because um, Naples was already ruled by the Capetians with Charles of Anjou. We made a couple of year, uh, videos this year, actu actually more about the topic. And uh, there was still, however, something separated ideally from, from France, right? Um, but obviously they, they were operating together and so uh, at that point, it was just, let's say, if not open warfare between uh, the, the, um, the German Emperor Kingdom of France, which was not the case, actually, um, not even in practice, but still the, the, the Capetians could do what they want at the peak of their power. By the way, we're talking about Philip IV, really, at that point being right, uh, having a massive power, a massive state. Henry VII had just... You know, yes, the, there was the, the inheritance of the Bohemian throne, etc., but altogether was just launching this broader mm, offensive in, in Italy to to enter within that sphere, you know, not opposing themselves to, to France um, directly, right in face. So that's why also the French probably felt um, that, you know, completely... Uh, Henry was was crowned emperor in Rome, right? But, but they, they they had to to change church because there were crossbow bolts, uh, you know, flying from from everywhere. So the but um, the, the, that tells you how just formal at that point the title was. I made a video about Henry the Seventh, Ludwig the Bavarian, that explains a bit was what was going on in the empire. Broadly speaking, Henry died in Italy of malaria during the expedition anyway so what was happening in burgundy was of really relative importance it was important but not as much as these other events um, while instead the, the historical regions uh, region of the dauphine was effectively annexed by france to a series of actually accidental at least largely the accidental developments between 1343 1349 so also around the same time, but there was a fierce competition even there between the, the founded Counts of Savoy 
the, um, the the bloody affairs that were very complicated also in the political um, uh, properly in the ter territorial dominations and their composition but we'll, we, we will make some videos about that um, at some point and uh, the um, issue of whether the king or emperor had ultimate sovereignty over the Dauphiné, however, remained unclear until well into the 15th century. So again, the ambiguity remained at a point. The county of Provence, instead, in all this, given the north, the French could step so directly in Burgundy, nor, nor the Holy Roman Emperors had much of a rich anymore, was ruled by junior branches of the House of France from 1246 onwards. Right? Uh, however, it came formally to be part of the Kingdom of France with the death of uh, Charles de Men on December uh, 11, 1481. Previously, the County of Provence, as we've seen, had been occupied by, or at least had been uh, covered by in, in office by the Catalans and uh, it's just through marriage that Charles of Anjou had become Count of Provence and from there he had managed to mount up an expedition to seize the Kingdom of Sicily as, as you know so from Provence um, actually the uh, the Angevins managed to because Charles was also, he was Pierre Francis, uh, uh, Count of Anjou, right? But he was the brother of the King of France, Louis IX. So, uh, also interfered in Piedmont, where they exported from Provence the, the Seneschal administration that was used in the local Piedmontese, to, to manage the local Piedmontese um, feudal, feudal nobility and communes. But uh, this Angevin presence in Piedmont eventually was um, wiped out by the, the Milanese by the, the mid-14th century. There was a stillborn attempt to revive the kingdom of Burgundy slash Arles made by the same Charles of Anjou at some point. This was a machination coordinated with Pope Nicholas III, uh, which could have gone further if the uh, Sicilian Vespers had not happened. Um, it had been negotiated even with the Holy Roman Emperor, or better, with the King of the Romans at the time, Rudolf of Habsburg, that never came uh, to, to Italy eventually to seize the crown, but that was in important con contact with the papacy, uh, and also, in fact, ceded to the papal states and the, the Romagnol areas in exchange for, for his crown and managed to secure the Habsburgic power in, in Austria as a consequence. But, well, at this point, Charles was already king of Sicily as um, Rudolf agreed uh, for his daughter Clemens of Austria to marry Charles' grandson, Charles Martel of Anjou, that would have actually become the founder of the Anjou dynasty in Hungary. Uh, at the time, there had been an issue because um, the county of Provence had been, uh, you know, formally recognized by uh, under the control of Charles of Anjou uh, after the problem had been settled with Margaret of Provence, the Queen Dowager of France, who was the wife of Louis the Ninth, who she had been born in Fourcalquier. Um, so, whose control, you know, really was there. Um, however, this plan of essentially making Mary the daughter of Rudolf of Habsburg with the grandson of Charles of Anjou was also um, properly arranged to by the papacy to expect northern Italy to become a kingdom carved out of the imperial territory. Right? Um, and all this in, in exchange to become for, for Rudolf to become the sole imperial candidate. At, at that point, which was not yet, um, you know, defined at the, at the point. But again, before the couple could be sent to 
rule uh, as the, the king of Arles restored, the Sicilian Vespers broke out. And so nothing was done of it because troops had to be properly drawn from everywhere. And this area uh, could not see this broader political and institutional settlement. And uh, also in Germany, the, the political uh, situation changed because of uh, of this sudden weakening of, of Charles of Anjou. And as you know, Rudolf had fought against Ottokar of Bohemia, had been allied with Charles of Anjou. So it's a very complex situation. That's why in this video, I would always like to digress, but and I don't know how much you understand also what I'm t saying, but just to make you understand the level of messed up situation that it was. Um, Charles IV of Luxembourg, however, um, the you know grandson of Henry the Seventh in 1365 was the last Holy Roman Emperor to be crowned king at Arles, quite meaningfully. As you know, Charles was quite active in all over Europe. He had a sense, great sense of the you know, his universal duty. Um, so he was privileging in this important moment of crisis of Europe. Also, the, the cities as important growing centers, eventually, of uh, over the rest of, of the countries. Uh, think about the same Prague in Bohemia, and so that was the heart of 14th century Europe because of this, this policy. And so um, there was an opportunity for everyone, say, in these centers, to, for these centers to, to, to appoint even of some specific legacies, etc. We're talking about 200 years later, the Arlesian coronation of Frederick I in 1178. So pro properly, uh, just almost an antiquarian revival of a situation that de facto did not correspond to, to reality anymore. Um, of course, the attempt to revive the imperial hold on the kingdom wouldn't succeed. Um, and uh, in part, Charles compensated by annexating the county of Savoy to the Kingdom of Germany, which was an interesting way of putting um, that. But um, during his visit to Paris in early 1378, Charles IV granted the title of Imperial Vicar over the Kingdom of Arles to the nine-year-old Dauphin Charles of France that would become the later Charles VI. Uh, however, only for the lifetime of, of the latter. That is to say, not as an inheritance linearly. It was just a temporary provision to say, okay, you, you are in charge for life uh, because the emperor told you. Because in theory, also the French were under the empire, but wasn't. But in practice, the situation was very different. But the title King of Art remained one of the Holy Roman Imperial subsidiary titles until the dissolution of the empire with the secularization of 1806, right? There was, as you know, also within the various um, uh, uh, archbishops of, of Germany, the, the, three electing, uh, the three electors, the one of Trier, historically acting as an arch councillors of, uh, originally it was a, about France, right? Just like Cologne, because of Colonia Agrippina was for Italy, you know, the historical connection, Mainz was for Germany uh, instead. Um, this one was, uh, let's say, the, 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 the French part was shifted to the concept of Burgundy, Ar being the, uh, yes, objectively an imperial dependency. And this was codified by the same Golden Bull of 1356. And yes, objectively at that time, also France was in quite, quite of a trouble. And um, nobody could say what would have happened uh, eventually. Let's assume France had not recovered from the Hundred Years War. Maybe that area would have been re, re, uh, you know, not if not reabsorbed directly by the Empire, but would have not en uh, ended under the French. Consider the the French papal alliance with Avignon on the Rhone, so exactly at the border between France and. Uh, Burgundy, so as, as to say, well, 
you know, this is our center now, and the, the entire area has that important, um, you know, e even papal and pro-French presence. You know, that the Versailles, until the French Revolution, the papacy, the papal states included those part of the, those French areas, like uh, in what had become by that point a French controlled, right, part of the, the, the French state, you know, French monarchy um, territory, right? And there was even in the 15th century a revival of the Kingdom of Burgundy by the Duke Charles the Bold of Burgundy in a bit of a uh, flamboyant way. You know, the, the, the Dukes of Burgundy uh, at, at this point believed to be superior to any other ruler in Europe. Uh, they wanted to become emperors, kings of Jerusalem, and they were the, uh, the commanders of all the, the great crusades. Uh, they were considered as the most powerful and, uh, and splendid court in Europe. So, if you look at the map of Burgundy, uh, the, the Valois-Burgundy, in fact, controlled from the original Dutch, and had managed to annexate among the various um, territories, such as the Duchy of Luxembourg, the, the one of Brabant, the county of Flanders, the county of Vermandois, etc., also the Palatinate, that is to say, the, the county of Burgundy. So, uh, Besançon was actually out. It was just a little island within the wall county, but they had occupied that uh, as well, right? And um, at some point, the Burgundians expanded in the 60s, in the 70s, even in um, in the Habsburg land Landgraviate of Alsace, Breisgau, uh, etc. So, when you look at the Dutch of Burgundy, the Palatinate, in the south it was just Savoy, telling the truth, that at the time was not just an irrelevant power, and actually was siding with the same Burgundy. Um, there was the, the county of uh, Harolais, the county of Mahon. Um, and so it, it was not really a distant land, after all, to revive uh, a power in. But... Um, there was no possibility. Eventually, Charles died anyway, and uh, Burgundy had other axes of expansion, even within Germany. Think about the siege of Neuss, etc., to just consolidate there, which was an era that, after all, uh, had remained largely um, autonomous and was being peripheral, also considering that France was reviving its power and was such a huge one. It's not that by recovering that land, Burgundy would have succeeded. It was, they had, had mostly to rely on, on their own Central European power, however, failed and disgregated. Um, however, there was at some point uh, rather the attempt from Charles to revive a formal recognition that was negotiated uh, together with Frederick III of, uh, of Habsburg, and as you know, uh, the, the Valois Burgundy and the Habsburgs would, would bring to the matrimonial alliance and everything, but th this were uh, the specific coronation of king uh, to king of Burgundy would have had to happen at Trier, um, so, it w because of the aforementioned arch cancellorship over Burgundy, and so this kind of broader revival. However, the the emperor fled previous to the, cer the ceremony in 1473 because of the general failure of the negotiations. Right? He was displeased with the duke's attitude that probably wanted to go very far. Um, and so, factually, that last chance of, historically, of, of Burgundy being the kingdom of Burgundy being revived died with the Dutch of Burgundy and its other territories, uh, together with Charles at the Battle of Nancy in 1477. And, yeah, this is pretty much it um, there would be so much to discuss I, I still have to make a video about the Burgundian state the one of the Valois Burgundy per se um, not just the duchy uh, and 
we will have to talk about the Dutch of Burgundy as well. Recently I I made some video about southern France in general and uh, Occitania is um, you know, it's underrated, let's say, historically, because it didn't really provide with a, a real center of some kind of power that managed eventually to to take over. But it's important to remember that uh, before the French annexation of these areas, there, there was still, um, say, even if, even if just a relic of, of a previous kingdom, but it, this thing had existed, right? And, and that the, under the Holy Roman Empire, the... The Burgundian crown was taken quite seriously because it meant again to another crown in the list uh, and so some important international recognition but at some point also the possibility of reviving some power locally because still these lands were were profitable were um, were important especially before the uh, the the 13th 14th century crisis uh, because uh, of, uh, of the Hundred Years War that engulfed a great part of southern France, but mostly also the fact that the of the decline of the Champagne fairs, the uh, the fact that the Genoese were ousted by the Aragonese, they had to change route um, from the, the Provencal one. Um, the Rhone Valley as a major highway kind of declined, right, and so. When we see again in in the 15th century with the Valois Burgundy uh, right now, it's you know that was just become a peripheral area and would never be revived in a concretely political sense. But at, at the same at time of the Charles of Anjou and Rudolf of Habsburg, that there was some interesting thing that could be done with it still. In any case, for today I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time